You may remember that Liev Schreiber played him in the Oscar-winning Spotlight about Barron's time leading the Boston Globe expose of abuse in the Catholic Church. We met this week at our mutual alma mater, Lehigh University, where Barron had been editor of the student newspaper, The Brown and White, which is celebrating its 125th anniversary, and Lehigh welcomed him back for an event called The Future of Journalism. The Brown and White is turning 125. Right. You're back on campus to be honored. You were the editor-in-chief of The Brown and White in your era. Give me one recollection from your stewardship of the newspaper. What comes to mind? Uh, the investigative work that we did at the time. Really? I mean, I think the, the university wasn't accustomed to that. Uh, we had a number of people on our staff who were good at it. Uh, uh, one in particular, a, a good friend of mine, Jeff Bloom, who was uh, uh, terrific at it. And uh, we shook up the administration in a lot of ways, uh, obtained information that they did not want us to obtain. Uh, Sounds familiar, into, by the way. Shaking uh, up administrations, getting information they don't want you to get. It was very good preparation for the rest <laughs> of my career and my life. What parallels do you see between the role that your newspaper is playing today amidst this current impeachment inquiry and the historic role that the Post played during Watergate? Well, I don't think uh, back to Watergate. I, I think of what we have to do today. Uh, and I recognize that our job is to provide the public with the information that it needs and deserves to know in a democracy. Uh, and so I think that that's what our mission is. I think that's the, what we have to do is make sure that we fulfill that mission, uh, that we focus on it, uh, that we don't get distracted by the attacks on us, uh, by the polarization in American society, but recognize that the reason that we have a First Amendment in this country, the reason the founders wrote that amendment was so that there would be a check on government. You referenced the criticism. The president, I, I think, just today referred to the media as scum. Mm. He calls fake news. He refers the media as being corrupt. Do you think he does that for political advantage or because that's how upset he is with the coverage? I think he does it largely for political advantage, frankly. Uh, I think he does it because he knows that it's helpful to have an enemy. He knows that the press uh, is not beloved in, in the country, and so they make a very convenient enemy. And he wants to position the press as being the opposition party so that the press will not be believed, so that he can undermine the credibility, the credibility of the press. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to disqualify the press as an arbiter of fact uh, so that there's only one person, one institution that is believed, the White House and himself, so that, his, so that the public will only believe him and believe no one else. And it's not just disqualifying the press as an arbiter of fact, it's qualifying, disqualifying the courts as an arbiter of fact, the intelligence agencies as an arbiter of fact, the scientists as an arbiter of fact, historians as an arbiter of fact. Any independent source of information is being disqualified as an arbiter of fact, uh, or would be if he had his way. You defended two Washington Post reporters recently, Philip Rucker and Ashley Parker, by saying in part, the president's statement fits into a pattern of seeking to denigrate and intimidate the press. It's unwarranted and dangerous, and it represents a threat to a free press in this country. What kind of a threat? A physical threat, a censorship threat, a combination of both? Well, it's a combination, certainly. Certainly there have been physical threats as a result of the language that he's used. He's used very threatening language toward the press. Uh, he stirred up uh, his followers. As a result, uh, major news organizations have had to take special precautions to protect the security of uh, the people on their staff, and it's a, very, it's a very serious matter. It creates the conditions for potential more forceful action against the press should he choose at some point to take it. I saw that via Twitter you embraced a speech that was given at Brown by A.G. Salzberger, the publisher of The Times. It had to do with the security of reporters overseas. Will you speak to that? Yeah, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, I think that uh, we, we see the rise of uh, autocratic governments, uh, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes in other countries. Uh, they have uh, moved against uh, journalists within their own countries. But our journalists who are working in those other countries also face risks uh, from those autocratic regimes. And uh, you always count on the U.S. government to stand up for those journalists to make sure that they uh, are, are safe, that they will intervene with these other countries on behalf of journalists should they face threats. And what we're finding now is that the U.S. government has not, is not the advocate for a free press around the world as it was in the past. And what we've seen in the instance of the New York Times is that when the government was counted on to intervene on behalf of 
their journalists who were working overseas who were at risk, it couldn't necessarily count on this administration to come to their aid. It sounds to me like you worry the president doesn't have your back. He does not have our back. Philip Bump, one of your reporters, wrote a piece at the end of the Mueller probe where he noted that he, he thinks it, it landed with less of an impact than it would have had had there not been so much solid investigative journalism. Because by the time the Mueller report came out, we kind of knew all that. Might we be headed in the same direction in the impeachment inquiry, that whatever shape it takes, when it ends, by the time we get there, hey, we read it in the Washington Post or the Times or CNN. Well, possibly. Uh, I'm not sure that we can have the luxury of thinking about that. Uh, I think we still have our jobs to do. Uh, I think the one reason uh, the press was cited so often in the Mueller report is because we had done such a good job of investigating and reporting. The Mueller report actually, contrary to what the president said, validated so much of the reporting that was done. Sure, there were some errors along the way. Uh, I can't predict, I can't be a pundit. All I can do, all we can do as an institution is do our jobs. Democracy dies in darkness. That's your mantra. What's the condition of our light? Uh, well, there's some, uh, we still have a democracy, I'm happy to say. Uh, there are some threats to that democracy. I think the institutions in the country are, uh, are being tested in a way that they have not been before. Uh, the press is one of those institutions. The courts are another institution. Congress is certainly being tested as to whether it's willing to assert its rights. Uh, we have a situation uh, where more power has been uh, aggregated within the, within the executive branch. That's, been a, that's not unique to the Trump administration. That's happened over a longer period of time and every president has tried to accumulate more and more power. Uh, and so uh, I think the institutions of the country that are designed to sort of there's supposed to be a tension between those institutions. That's, that's how this democracy is built. But I think those institutions uh, are being tested in a major way.